Um, right. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Stephen Hulgate. Um, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Hegel Society of Great Britain to the second installment of our virtual conference uh, this year. Um, it's a delight to be able to welcome uh, Lydia Moland from Colby College in Maine, um, who is going to talk to us uh, tonight on Hegel and music, um, unless the topic has changed, but that's what I think it's going to be. Um, Lydia has published um, uh, one book on Hegel and political identity, and then an absolutely phenomenal book on, on Hegel's aesthetics, one of the best books around on, uh, on Hegel's aesthetics. Um, and I'm assuming all of you here are interested in Hegel's aesthetics, but if you don't know Hegel's aesthetics, very well, then Lydia's book is, a, is an excellent place uh, to start and to continue reading. Um, Lydia is also working currently on a biography of uh, Lydia Maria Child, an American uh, abolitionist from the 19th century. Um, and uh, she is also interested in the philosophy of humor and comedy. And if you check out Lydia's website, you can see a delightful um, um, interview session that she uh, did with them. Um, Michael Schur uh, and uh, one of the William Harper Jackson's that his name from uh, The Good Place. So if you're fans of The Good Place, which you all should be, then uh, please do uh, watch that. Um, anyway, it is great to have you all here and a real delight to have Lydia here. And so without further ado, I will pass over to you, Lydia. And thank you very much for uh, talking to us this evening. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what a pleasure to be here and what a bittersweet um, thing to be virtual. I was so looking forward to being with all of you in person two summers ago and then again this summer and it feels like an especially um, yeah, bittersweet thing to have to do this online, but it is better than nothing and uh, I still consider myself very fortunate um, in all ways relating to the pandemic, so I'm not complaining. Um, thank you for accommodating my teaching schedule. Um, I know you had to shift the time you usually do these um, and I this makes me un also unable to attend some of the other um, sessions because of my teaching schedule. So I regret that, but I hope they all go well. I'm sure they will. Um, it's a special pleasure and honor for me to uh, have been invited by Stephen, whose work really got me going on the aesthetics. It was that early edited volume um, on Hegel and the Arts that I read a long time ago and thought about for a long time before realizing that this was really something I wanted to do more work on. So um, that has been absolutely seminal in my own research. So thank you for that um, work. So I think what I'd like to do is I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to talk for a little bit um, through some slides just as a way to try to position us in Hegel's aesthetics more generally. And then I'm going to and talk about some of the major themes um, in the book that Stephen mentioned. And then I'm going to read a part of the chapter on music uh, from that book. So I'm hoping that'll be a, a good combination of just talking and reading. So let me share my screen here. Okay, can I get a quick thumbs up if that is visible? All right, good, okay. So I just wanted to, again, set the stage a little bit by talking about a few of Hegel's systematic commitments that structure the, um, the way I interpret the, the, his aesthetics here. And none of these will be surprising to any of you, but um, I hope that the refresher and also orientation will help us um, get to a good understanding. So the first is just that the true is the whole. So Hegel says this early on in the phenomenology. Um, what he means by it, of course, is the subject to much of much debate and interpretation. And I think it's fair to say he means a lot of things by it. Um, but I want to have that as a reminder that for Hegel, everything is interconnected um, and reality itself is a mutually forming whole, as I interpret it. And one of the things that this means is that there's no given. So there's no thing in itself. Um, there's not sort of nature that's just out there waiting for us to apprehend it. Um, that everything that humans interact with is a combination of our taking in things that are external to us, but also forming and being formed by those things um, to construct what we think of as reality. And part of one of the words that Hegel uses to describe this uh, very ambitious idea is the idea. So I have this quote from the logic here. The idea is Hegel's shorthand 
for the interpenetrating, mutually determining unity of thought and object. And here's Hegel's quote. It is the subject object as the unity of the ideal and the real, of the finite and the infinite, of the soul and the body, as the possibility that has actuality in itself, as that whose nature can, compre can be comprehended only as existing. And by the way, at the end of that, Hegel says, and so forth, which I always think is hilarious because it's kind of got everything there already, but he clearly could go on. And then art in Hegel's scheme is the appearance of the idea to the senses. So it's going to be the, all of those things that are in that quote defining the idea, but it has to appear to us in some sort of sensual form. So that's a very tall order for art. Um, and it is one of the ways in which the importance of art, I think, becomes very clear. So here are a couple of the main claims that I make in the book. So Hegel's aesthetics is not just an illustration of his idealism. Instead, it is crucial to understanding what his idealism means. And it is also essential to grasping major parts of his system, including his theories of the senses, selfhood, perception, and recognition. So I think there's, as there often is with the philosophy of art, um, a temptation to just treat it as an illustration or as ancillary or as not particularly crucial to the understanding of the entire philosophy. And I really, I think we deprive ourselves of a lot of information about what Hegel means by some of these more general um, claims if we don't take his philosophy of art as a serious place to look for them. Another art, according to Hegel, is a sensuous experience of truth. So here's one way I put it in the book, the artistic process, the art object itself, and our experience of that object all embody Hegel's claim that objects are not in fact independent, waiting to be apprehended, but that we and the world's objects are part of a mutually determining whole. We are implicitly involved in this mutual formative, mutually formative process throughout our lives. And art is one of the ways of making this explicit. So I'm hoping to make this a little clearer as I go. But I think one of the things that art does for us is it rescues us from our kind of prosaic, um, commonsensical, utilitarian interaction of the world by jostling us out of it and showing us what we're doing when we engage with the world all the time, but that we actually aren't aware of. Um, aesthetic experience, which as I'm sure most of you are aware is a topic Hegel gives very little explicit attention to um, in contrast to Kant, for instance, is the joy of recognized truth. So a truth that can pierce the hard shell of our ordinary prosaic lives and reveal the poetry at the core of existence. So that's already a little bit on the topic I was just mentioning. Um, so the idea that art pierces the shell of the everyday and the prosaic and reveals the poetry. And as I put at the end of that quote, Hegel's very clear that when he uses the word poetry, he's often, except in the chapter specifically on poetry, talking about something much more general, namely a making, so from the Greek poein. So there's a sense in which all of reality is poetic for Hegel because it's all part of a making, um, but we lose that sense, we lose that knowledge in our prosaic lives and art calls us back to it. One of the other major points of the, of the book is my claim that there has been an overemphasis almost to the point of exclusivity on part two of Hegel's lecture on art. So I want to spend some time saying what that, what the different parts do and how music fits into them. So part two, which is the one most people are familiar with, um, in, in that part, Hegel discusses particular art forms and analyzes the adequacy of the worldviews that underlie them. So the three art forms are symbolic, classical, and romantic art. And one of the things that occurred to me at some point was that if we take only part two into account or overemphasize it, Hegel's philosophy of art seems to be a kind of expressionism about our social political lives. So if we only read part two or primarily focus on part two, we think, okay, well, the Greeks had this worldview and they expressed it in art. We have a different worldview, we're expressing it in art. And we tend to think then of Hegel's philosophy as primarily just doing that, showing us how different social political 
groups express themselves in art. And part three, by contrast, is focused on what Hegel calls the individual arts, which are architecture, sculpture, painting, music, and poetry, and on our experience of space, perception, feeling, and imagination. And I put feeling in blue there because that's um, the focus in music. So I argue that our freedom is also contingent on our understanding. Sorry, I have to get this bar out of my way so I can read my own text. Um, on our understanding of our own creative activity in regard to these aspects of our experience. And that Hegel believes that art can help us become conscious of that activity. So in focusing on um, architecture, painting, sculpture, music, and poetry, Hegel, it's not that he ever completely uh, lets go of the social, political, or the worldview interpretation, but he's much more focusing on what does it mean for us to hear things and how does music, for instance, bring our attention to that part of our perception and the kind of um, idea of ourselves that he thinks it enables. All right, um, so here again, most of you, none of this is going to be new to, but I think it's helpful to situate what Hegel's doing in the system. So I'm focusing on the blue parts all the way through. So the philosophy of spirit as the culmination or the third part of that trilogy. Philosophy of spirit divides into subjective, objective, and absolute spirit. And then absolute spirit divides into art, religion, and philosophy. So the philosophy of art, and again, I'm trying to rearrange things so I can see my own screen, um, divides into these parts. So I'll go into this a little bit more now. So as I said, part two, the particular art forms, which, are, which Hegel also calls worldviews, which are symbolic, classical, and romantic. Now romantic here, I think it's really important to remember, in this case, Hegel just means post-Christian. He doesn't mean the romantic movement around him, the Schlegels and Novalis, for instance. He really means anything that comes after the dissolution of the classical worldview. And that'll be, in my view, important for uh, saying how we should understand the end of art in this context. And then part three, which again is the system of the individual arts. And again, one of the major claims of my book that this section has been neglected. Um, here's the way the dialectic works there. So we have architecture, which is the art of externality. So Hegel talks about architecture as completely external to humans, as unspiritual. Um, architecture is also the thing that allows us to experience space as space. So if we're trying to sort of think about how humans cognize the world, architecture is one of the things that can bring our attention to space as space and help us think about space. Um, and next we have sculpture, which is the art of individuality. And the way Hegel talks about this is sculpture as the perfect interpenetration between spirit and nature. So unlike architecture, um, sculpture has a spiritual component, um, but it's not purely spiritual the way some are, or more spiritual the way some of the following art forms will be. And then we have painting, music, and poetry, which Hegel actually groups together as the arts of subjectivity. So you can see again how the, the dialectic is supposed to work, externality, individuality, and subjectivity. So all three of these, painting, music, and poetry, are where we focus on what happens really within the subject, less and less what is outside. So obviously architecture is outside, sculpture is outside, Painting is outside, but Hegel's really just interested in the kind of perspectival understanding of, of painting where the third dimension of painting is actually not outside of us, it's inside of us. We see that even though it's not there, um, which Hegel thinks allows us to bring our attention to our own perception of painting so that we start to be aware of our own senses and the way our minds work. Hegel also calls these the romantic arts because he thinks that all of them come to their highest expression in the post-classical world. So after the advent of Christianity, reorients people towards the subjective, um, gives us a sense of interiority and even divinity within ourselves that we wouldn't have had before. And one of the things that's trickiest, uh, I think, about this part of the dialectic um, in art 
is that these arts are closer to idealist truth for Hegel because they have this um, sense of subjectivity that the other two artworks um, only have incompletely. So they, so if we're talking about art as one of the ways we experience truth, these arts get closer to that, but they are further from art's highest point. So I'm going to talk about this again in a second, but like how to decide where Hegel thinks certain things are ending and certain things are transitioning. And when he says something is the highest of this or the highest of that, I think it, it's important to get our heads around the idea that the highest kind of art, because it's the closest interpenetration of the spirit and spiritual and the natural is sculpture. But that doesn't mean it's the highest expression of the truth, but the better we are at articulating truth, the further from art we get. So to repeat here, um, so painting, so we're, we're getting more um, subjective into the subjective realm here. So painting Hegel describes as subjectivity's retreat. So insofar as we under, start to understand our own mental processes as what allows us to see just the juxtaposition of color as shape, for instance, we, we retreat into ourselves. Also painting is very good at showing us what subjectivity in retreat looks like. So Hegel talks about um, Madonnas whose interior gaze looks like they're retreating. So he thinks painting is especially good at expressing that. Music is subjectivity's feeling of itself. And it is the most subjective of the arts. And then in poetry, we get the reintegration of subjectivity back in the world. So obviously Hegel's never going to want to just sort of go all the way to the extreme. He's going to want to show how the synthesis um, happens. And so once poetry starts working with images, external images, um, in evoking sunsets or nightingales or Grecian urns or whatever, and then once it transitions into drama where there's actually action and people on the stage in an external way, then we have that subjectivity reintegrated into the world. There are three ways in which that happens, epic, lyric, and dramatic poetry. So I hope that gives you a sense then of how what I'm going to say fits into Hegel's um, bigger systematic claims. And then I wanted to spend a minute talking about art's endings. So again, not news to any of you that this is one of the most complicated things to get your head around in Hegel, the extent to which he thinks art ends why he says it ends when it ends and i've decided there are three answers to this i hope hegel would approve of that um, and the short answer is that art kind of ends all over the place all the time and it's very hard to figure out in which way it's ending when so here's my general um, suggestion so there's one big historical end which is the transition from the classical world to christianity and why is that an end it's because at this point, artists no longer create, but only depict the divine. So if the Greek myths and sculptures were actually the artists giving the Greeks their gods, then the fact that Christianity makes the claim that Jesus is born in actual time and space and is a historical figure means that art can only depict the divine and is no longer creating it. So that's a kind of major end of art's potential. But there are also some very important conceptual endings, lots of them. So again, thinking about part two, the particular arts, the ends of the particular arts. Um, so subjective art, so, sorry, symbolic art ends as it transitions into the classical. Classical art ends as it transitions into the romantic. And the particular arts end generally after romantic art exhausts the possibilities of the particular arts. So I'm going to put this up here with apologies that this is maybe more technicality than um, you're up for. But I just want you to, I want you to have a sense of what I mean by um, it runs its course conceptually. So Hegel says that symbolic art is an inadequate conception of the idea. So we have here, you know, nature is conceived as divine or sort of monsters conceived of as the divine, et cetera. Those are inadequate conceptions of the divine and symbolic art also portrays them inadequately. For classical art, we have another inadequate conception of the idea. 
but it's in adequate form. So the Greeks also didn't understand that all humans were free, etc. They had an inadequate understanding, but they gave that inadequate understanding an adequate form. Romantic art is an adequate conception of the idea in an inadequate form, right? So with romantic, the romantic idea, um, Hegel thinks people understand that each human is worthy of dignity and respect and all humans are free. Um, so that is true in the romantic era, but romantic art can only express that inadequately. And then philosophy can be the adequate conception of the idea in an adequate form, but then it's no longer art. So each individual art then ends conceptually again. So just like the, the particular arts end conceptually, the individual arts end conceptually after it reaches its paradigmatic case and transitions into the next individual art. This is not chronological, this is conceptual. The independent arts end generally when poetry exhausts the conceptual possibilities of individual art and transitions into philosophy. So here, um, again, you'll recognize this now. So architecture is the internal, sculpture is the individual. The paradigmatic case of, of architecture is the Sphinx. The paradigmatic case of sculpture is really early depictions of Athena, et cetera. And once those are reached, then conceptually things transition to the next art form. Um, and there can still be an art of that kind, but it's not going to be um, at the, it's not going to be paradigmatic. And speaking of which, um, there will be lots of those cases then will be what I call the multiple prosaic endings. And these are cases when art lapses into forms that no longer bring our awareness to the claims of idealism. So remember on the first slide, I said that um, this is part of Hegel's hope for art, that it brings the idea to our senses. And if the idea is the interpenetration of the finite and the infinite and all of the other things he mentioned there, um, things that no longer bring our awareness to that and to the mutual determination, the poetic unity and difference, etc., no longer make the idea appear to the senses. And those again are kind of all over the place. Um, here are a couple of examples. Agreeable sculpture. <laughs> so Hegel thinks only a very early kind of Greek sculpture actually got sculpture at its paradigmatic best. And as soon as sculpture started to show subjectivity, you know, the little boy pulling the thorn from his foot or, you know, the graces dancing or something like that, that's agreeable and it's no longer calling our attention in Hegel's very specific sense um, to the interpenetration of the spiritual and the natural in um, sculpture. Satire um, is a prosaic form because it focuses only on division, right? There's no happy ending. It's just all kind of biting disagreement. Subjective humor is too subjective, surprise, surprise. So you don't get the integration of the objective into uh, the subjective. So people like John Paul are Hegel's target here. Abstract music I'll talk about in a moment. Naturalism in poetry. So Hegel's concerned that poetry that claims only to be describing what it sees rather than showing humans interaction in, uh, in seeing nature and calling nature into being in the form that we understand it. Any poetry that claims not to be doing that is also not bringing our attention um, to the idea. Contemporary comedy, Hegel thinks is too domestic and too prosaic and also too mean. So he thinks that Tartuffe is just too mean, um, therefore also not um, the kind of synthetic um, culmination and reunification that you find, for instance, in Aristophanes, et cetera. So there, I could give 50 more examples of that, um, but I hope that gives you a sense anyway. So what I'm going to do and what follows then, again, is talk a little bit about the chap chapter nine in my book, um, just very briefly about music during this time. And again, this won't be news um, to many of you. Music makes this incredible turn during this period from in some cases not being considered an art at all because it's too derivative, it's too ephemeral, you can't point to it, you can't touch it, you can't see it. Um, you know, maybe it has something to do with the spheres and the movement of the stars, but who really knows? Maybe it's just entertainment to being the art for some people. Anyway, so for instance, E.T.A. Hoffman, Teek, 
both are theorizing in very explicit ways um, right during Hegel's generation about music maybe being the most important art and the best way for us to experience truth through the senses. Um, and at the same time, Beethoven is, com is composing music that people are interpreting that way. Mendelssohn is reviving, revitalizing Bach. And of course, it's not long after this that Schopenhauer um, talks about music as absolutely central. So I'm going to um, now read the first section of this um, chapter, which is about subjectivity, time, music, and feeling. I'm going to skip the passages on time, melody, and harmony, um, but you should know that Hegel has whole sections in which he talks about the way melody and harmony play into the way music impacts us. Um, he also talks about the fact that music has to be sung, played, or performed, and I give some attention to um, what he says there in that section, and then I will read again the part in which I talk about the ends of music. Um, so I think I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, so I can just see as many of you as I can and commence reading. Okay, so again, this section is called Subjectivity, Time, Music, and Feeling. So subjectivity is itself the product of negativity. In order to have a sense of itself as subjective at all, the subject must negate the external world, canceling all three dimensions, turning inward, and making itself its own object. It then recognizes that this other is itself, and so cancels the negation, asserting its unity with itself. The subject at this abstract stage is, as John Salas puts it, quote, an empty posting of itself as other, and then a canceling of this otherness such that the unity is restored. As long as the subject has no content but itself, it remains an abstract series of double negations. What is decisive for this account of subjectivity to Hegel's theory of music is, to quote Salas again, that, quote, the same process is at the core of time. As Hegel first argued in the phenomenology, time initially shares with subjectivity the problem of an endless self-canceling series. To begin with, it is only an unstable sequence of nows, since each time we point to now, that now is past, and a new now replaces it, only itself to be replaced. In his lectures on aesthetics, Hegel reiterates this claim and relates it to abstract subjectivity. So again, this is a quote from the aesthetics. The now, he says, still remains always the same in its alteration, for each point of time is a now, just as little distinguished from the other, regarded as merely a point of time, as the abstract self is from the object in which it cancels itself, and since this object is only the empty self itself, with it, in which it closes with itself. This series of nows is, like subjectivity, a double negation. What must happen for this ever-vanishing series of nows to become time is for the subject to synthesize them into a succession and recognize that synthesis as its own activity. In synthesizing this series of nows, the self becomes active. It also becomes aware of its own activity and so of itself. The self, as Julian Johnson puts it, thus, quote, unifies itself as existing in time by containing the succession of nows within itself and synthesizing them into itself. The subject unifies the stream of time and simultaneously unifies itself as existing through time in a constant identity. Unlike these ever vanishing nows, Hegel says, quote, the self is what persists in and of itself sorry, in and by itself, and its self-concentration interrupts the indefinite series of points of time and makes gaps in their abstract continuity, and in its awareness of its discrete experiences, the self recalls itself and finds itself again, end quote. The deep synergy between the self and time allows Hegel to claim, in an echo of Schelling, that, quote, the actual self itself belongs to time, and even coincides with time. As he also puts it, quote, the self is in time, and time is the being of the subject himself. 
Neither time nor subjectivity is a pre-existing substance. They are, as Salas says, nothing but the process. Art's mission throughout Hegel's philosophy has been to allow us to access the nature of reality as Hegel understands it through the senses. In order to give sensuous embodiment to the process underlying the subject's formation, and so to have sensuous access to this part of reality, Hegel says, quote, we need a material which for our apprehension is without stability and even as it arises and exists, vanishes once more. Where can we find a sensuous embodiment of the subject's double negation, as well as its becoming aware of itself through its synthesis of nows into time? And Hegel's answer is music. So music's material is sound. And sound correlates to both the self's initial cycle of self-negation and to the serial nows that are the foundation of time. It does this by being vibration. As Hegel initially argues in the encyclopedia, vibration is an external phenomenon, so a thing is set in motion. But the sound that is produced by the vibration cancels that externality. We experience it not in space, but only internally. Hegel does not hesitate to cast this fact in terms of his own philosophical commitment. So here's a slightly longer quote. Since the negativity into which the vibrating material enters here is on one side, the canceling of the spiritual situation, a cancellation canceled again by the reaction of the body. Therefore, the expression of this double negation, i.e. sound, is an externality, which in its coming to be is annihilated again, Peter finished it, by its very existence, and it vanishes of itself. Sound thus has the ba same basic form as both abstract subjectivity and as the unsynthesized nows that the subject synthesizes into a duration. It exhibits, as Salat says, the instability, the outcome of the double negativity. Our sense of hearing, too, embodies this double negation. The externally existing instrument that is struck or sounded, the drum or trumpet, for instance, is not what we sense. Its externality is negated in the tones it produces that reach the ear. The tone then fades away. Insofar as it achieves stability, it is only because it is carried forth by the inner subjective life, that is, in the memory of the listener. Hegel said of painting that the spectator, quote, is as it were in it from the beginning, is counted in with it, and the work exists only for the individual apprehending it. This is, if anything, more true of music. Even if all of this is true of sounds, sounds are not yet music. The transformation of sound into music correlates, Hegel claims, to the subject's synthesis of disappearing nows into time. Music as Hegel understands it is an organized series of sounds extended in time. The full transformation from sounds to music will require more particular determinations such as measure and harmony, but Hegel's initial point is that once sounds become related to each other through time, once the rising and falling tones are connected in our minds as a series, music proper comes into being. Time as such, he says, is the universal element in music. As an experience of time, music is, quote, an external medium which quickly vanishes and is canceled at the very moment of expression, unquote, and so correlates to the structure of subjectivity. Music moves us so profoundly then because it allows us to experience sensually the process through which we form our very subjectivity. Quote, since the time of the sound is that of the subject too, Hegel suggests, sound, quote, penetrates the self, grips it in its simplest being, and by means of the temporal movement and its rhythm sets the self in motion, unquote. Its power is such that music can even move us physically. And I have to say, I love this. I'm going to take it as a self-description on Hegel's part. Compelling rhythms make us want to, quote, beat time with them and join in singing the melody. And dance music even gets into our feet. In short, music gets hold of the individual as this man. What music both accesses and provokes when it penetrates the self in this way is Empfindung. 
And here we encounter difficulties in translation. Empfindung can be either translated sensation or feeling, but it is closer to sensation's connotation of physical feeling. Gefühl, generally translated feeling, can likewise be used to designate a physical sensation, but can also imply a mental phenomenon closer to emotion. Hegel does not systematically differentiate between the two. He even acknowledges that they are often used interchangeably, but in the encyclopedia, he suggests that Empfindung is, quote, connected with sensation. So mit der Empfindung hängt die Empfindlichkeit zusammen. And it emphasizes rather the side of passivity, the fact that we find ourselves feeling. Later, Hegel defines sensibility, or das Empfinden in general, as the healthy fellowship of the individual mind in the life of its bodily part. Fühlen, and by extension Gefühl, is more self-conscious. It, quote, notes the fact that it is we ourselves who feel. And that's a quote from the encyclopedia as well. But this distinction does not mean that Empfindung is essentially physical or unsophisticated. Hegel's discussion of Empfindung does include a description of the basic uh, physical senses, so sight and touch, etc. But it also includes inner sensations, Empfindung, such as anger, revenge, envy, shame, remorse, as well as, he says, sensations connected with an absolute universal, such as, quote, right, morality, religion, the beautiful, and the true. The key to understanding Empfindung seems to be instead that to be that it is something merely present, unreflective and unmediated, quote, no matter whether it originates in free mind or in the sensible world. This means that even spiritual material, complex things such as religion or beauty, can be felt in a physical way. Quote, the spiritual, rational, lawful, ethical, and religious content in assuming the form of feeling, empfindung, receives the shape of an object of sense, Hegel claims, thinking perhaps of the physical blushing prompted by shame or a gut feeling that something is wrong. In such moments, the self, quote, only feels and does not as yet seize itself as a subject confronting an object, unquote. It is, at least initially, only aware of itself feeling. And indeed, the crucial point about feeling or sensation for Hegel's theory of music is its relation to abstract subjectivity. At the level of the subject's making itself its own object, canceling that object, and then retrieving a sense of itself in this cancellation, the subject's only concern is itself. Its content is itself, or the quote, immediate self-sufficiency of the self and the self's relation to itself without any externality at all. Its self-identity, as Salas says, remains abstract and empty. It remains undifferentiated feeling. But what does Hegel mean by this? By claiming that music is undifferentiated feeling, does he mean that music can have no content? What does Hegel's, where does Hegel's theory place him in debates about whether music can have content, and if so, what kind? In our everyday lives, feelings generally have content in the sense that we can be sad about a death or proud of an accomplishment. But sometimes music elicits feelings that lack content in this sense. When music makes us sad, we need not feel sad about anything. We feel sadness in its most unmediated form. In such cases, Hegel suggests, the feeling subject's object is thus only itself. To repeat, the object is itself, feeling. In yet another formation, Hegel says that feeling is, quote, the widening subjectivity of the self which does proceed to have an objective content, but still leaves this content remaining in this immediate self-sufficiency of the self and the self's relation to itself without any externality at all. Music's intimate connection with the self means that it can provoke a wide range of particular feelings that allow the self to feel itself. Hegel's list again makes clear that Empfindung ex extends beyond simple physical sensations, to complex spiritual experiences. Music can elicit particular empfindungens such as, quote, all nuances of cheerfulness and severity, the sallies, moods, and jubilations of the soul, 
the degrees of anxiety, misery, and mourning, of awe, worship, love, etc. Music thus allows us to experience the feelings that painting could only hint at. It expresses interiority in a way painting could not. In addressing only the feeling self, music also differentiates, it, it differentiates itself from the other art that employs sound, namely poetry. Poetry's words are arbitrary signs. The word pearl, for instance, has no intrinsic connection to pearls themselves. Tones, by contrast, are not signs. Music is thus, Hegel suggests, sound as an end in itself and gives access to unmediated feeling in a way poetry cannot. But Hegel's assertion of a deep connection between music and feelings risks suggesting a problematic immediacy. It can seem that kinds of emotions, cheerfulness, misery, fear, etc., simply exist, independent of us, and then music stimulates them. If true, this would suggest a given that would undermine Hegel's claim that humans fundamentally and mutually form their reality. It would also seem obtuse during an age in which Herder and others were suggesting that music was capable, as Andrew Bowie puts it, quote, of revealing new aspects of being rather than just means of representing what was already there. This newness was present in music itself. Precisely at the time Hegel was writing, Bowie claims, Beethoven was turning from validating existing familiar emotions to channeling new emotions of, for instance, turbulence and exaltation. Worse, if Hegel is suggesting that the self exists through feeling emotions, and those emotions are given, then is the state of subjectivity simply given? That would seem problematic since, to quote Bowie again, the feeling self is also, quote, limited to important social considerations as the fact that it emerges via engagement with music as part of the objective social world indicates. So the question is, can Hegel's theory reflect this aspect of forming a mutual formation among music, subjectivity, and feeling? Hegel himself, I suggest in the previous chapter of the book, argued that the modern world produced new feelings. And his two examples are, are Christian love and bliss. These new emotions resulted from historical, religious, and cultural changes themselves brought about by human search for meaning within such change. Presumably then, he is open to the idea that music can cause us to feel these new emotions. As we do so, our sense of subjectivity will be formed by them. Our subjectivity, in other words, must also be responsive to this kind of change. The subject's own sense of itself shifts as what it feels shifts. Bowie suggests that modern, significant modern music, quote, confronts the most difficult issues in society concerning, for example, ineluctable change, the disintegration of traditional forms of order, and the precariousness of new forms of order, the nature of time, and the fragility of the self. Insofar as it does so, music responds to social transformations. What the subject feels when it hears such music changes, as then does the subject itself. These developments in subjectivity in turn affect social conditions that themselves affect what is possible for humans emotionally. In this way, the relation among music, feelings, and the self is a paradigmatic case of the mutual formation Hegel thinks is the foundation of reality. The feelings themselves are not immediate, but rather the product of these complex interrelations, but our feeling of them can be immediate in the sense that it has no object, but corresponds simply to the abstract self. Whatever their intersubjective world responsive nature, the feelings that music evokes will remain imprecise. Unlike poetry, which gives, quote, an, an external illusion to ideas and thoughts, music, Hegel says, must bring home to our feelings the simple essence of some subject matter in such note relationships as are akin to the inner nature of the subject. Hegel does not deny that some music will bring particular content to mind. Sorrowful music can prompt ideas about death, so-called program music can remind us of natural phenomena such as water or storms. 
but in its purest form, feeling remains the shrouding of the content, a concealment of whatever subject matter may have occasioned it. The indeterminateness of music's feeling, however, is not a detriment. If it were more determinate, music would no longer have access to subjectivity's structure. Okay, and now I'm going to skip to just the last couple of pages of the chapter um, where I talk about the ends of music. So music ends conceptually when its essence is accomplished. When, like painting relying on color alone without drawing as its basis, it consists of sound alone without an accompanying text. Painting reached a point where, as Fred Rush says, it was primarily concerned with exploring its own foundations. Music ends when it reaches a similar point. There is at that point nowhere further for music to go conceptually, although it can infinitely combine and explore its constituent parts, following its potential all the way, for instance, to the atonality of the 20th century. As with all the arts then, this conceptual ending does not mean that music can no longer be made or even that all music must now be instrumental. As long as music allows us to sense our subjectivity through feelings that it then enables us to reflect on and shape, it can fulfill its mission. The development of music after his lifetime, however, suggests that Hegel's vision was especially limited as regards music. His failure to mention Beethoven is perhaps explained by his concern that music, including the extremes, for instance, of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, will provoke strong emotions, but be unable to resolve them. Perhaps not unlike his objection to the unresolved contrast in Caspar David Friedrich's paintings. But it is a glaring omission and one that suggests Hegel's inability to predict how precisely Beethoven's music would become evidence of feeling's power. It is not known whether he had heard any Schubert, but surely the intimate melodies Schubert wrote for Schiller's poetry challenge Hegel's interdiction against setting excellent poetry to music. Looking far into the 20th century, we might imagine him fascinated by John Cage's attempt to bring our attention to both unmusical sound and to silence as ways of being aware of time and distinguishing our identities through time. But unless such music provokes a feeling, as opposed to intellectual stimulation or curiosity, it will not fulfill the role Hegel assigns to music. Much contemporary music, however, is entirely capable of fulfilling this role. Above, I quoted Bowie's claim that some contemporary music confronts, quote, this disintegration of traditional forms of order, the precariousness of new forms of order, the nature of time, and the fragility of the self. Perhaps music's exploring its own foundations is itself an evocation of our anxiety about foundations themselves. Insofar as what such music does is allow us to feel the anxiety of change and then process and form that feeling, then such music would meet Hegel's criteria. Part of my overall argument has been that even Hegel thought art still had much to do. Music, I think, fulfills its part of art's ongoing task in the modern world by allowing us to continue to feel ourselves, sometimes through emotions that are themselves evidence of our anxieties and our shifting social and historical realities. Music's more prosaic ending, so now I'm moving to the third category of endings that I talked about a little while ago, occur when composers fail to communicate spiritual meaning and instead write music that encourages only virtuosity or skillfulness. It ends too when it becomes only the servant of ideas, imitating bird songs or waterfalls in too literal an evocation of the world beyond feeling. Presumably, it will also be inferior when it provokes only the sentimentality of self-indulgent feelings Hegel so disliked in his romantic contemporaries. And while we will never know how Hegel himself justified dashing off after his lectures across Unter den Linden from the lecture hall to the opera house, I think there are two possibilities. One is that he thought Rossini's operas, and this is where I could sing a little Rossini, Stephen, if you were really interested, um, articulated the idea in sensuous form, and so were a genuine instance of art. 
Given what he says about opera generally, I argue in the next chapter, I think this is unlikely. Instead, my guess is that his love of opera indulged another human desire entirely, namely the desire to be entertained. If art's ending does not imply the end of enjoyment, his love of opera would be fully compatible with what his students knew of his philosophy. Perhaps music's most acute risk is becoming technical and inaccessible to feeling. As regards concert music, Hegel does appear prescient here. He foresaw that so-called classical music's development would make it difficult for an average listener to feel in the way Hegel thinks music should make us feel. Such music, Hegel worries, quote, loses its power over the whole inner life, all the more so as the pleasure it can give relates only to one side of the art, namely bare interest in the purely musical element in the composition and its skillfulness, a side of music which is for connoisseurs only and scarcely appeals to the general human interest in art. In such cases, Hegel suggests music is untrue to art. How then does successful music meet art's mandate by making the idea available to sense? Part three of Hegel's philosophy of art concerns our understanding as mutually forming the world we live in. Architecture allowed us to understand ourselves as existing in exter as sensing external space. Sculpture enabled us to experience embodied individuality. Painting en enabled an awareness of inner space. Music instead allows us to understand ourselves not only conceiving of time, but existing in time and coming into existence through time. In providing a close parallel with the way the self synthesizes itself in music, sorry, synthesizes itself in time, music allows us to experience our own self-determining essence. It is, as some commentators have pointed out, thus also an experience of freedom. Music contributes to art's expression of the idea in other ways as well. More than other arts, it makes us conscious that it exists only because we are there to hear it, facilitating our understanding of our participation in reality. It counters architecture's exteriority with profound interiority, thus ensuring that difference is synthesized into the unity of the individual arts. By combining harmonies with dissonance into a unified whole, music itself models the unity of unity and division. It resists the given even more than did painting, not only because it is not physically touchable, but because it quickly fades. While painting is shine or seeming in the sense that it shows a dimension that was not there, music appears as shined and then disappears, allowing us to contemplate the transient nature of reality itself. This transience will also be evident in the next individual art, namely poetry. But poetry's basis in language reorients it towards ideas, leaving music still dominant among the arts in the realm of feeling. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Lydia. That was uh, that was excellent, and it's just um, a joy to <clears throat> hear um, someone talk so clearly and lucidly about uh, Hegel on music, which which doesn't happen often enough. So thank you very much. Um, I suggest at this point that we have just a couple of minutes um, uh, pause um, to let Lydia gather her thoughts and everybody else as well, uh, and just uh, euphemistically so people can go and stretch their legs as it were. Um, uh, but just a couple of minutes, um, and then we'll be uh, we'll be back if that's okay. Is that all right with you, Lydia? Absolutely. Thank you. Good. Okay. All right. Good. That's okay. Uh, good. Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, uh, we'll use the the raise hand. That's the yellow hand function, if that's okay. So um, please feel free to um, pose your questions. Um, okay, Angelica, you're the first one I can see on the list. So off you go. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Lydia, that was uh, very nice. Uh, that was terrific. Um, I found very interesting um, that uh, claim, I mean, I think that's one of your central claim of how um, the relation between music, self and feeling is, uh, I think you said something like a, a mutual formation. Um, 
And that leads me uh, to uh, think of the psychology of, obje- uh, of subjective spirit in a new light. So my question is really um, uh, just a, a, an idea that uh, your talk uh, stimulated, uh, which is it seems that uh, the arts are sort of offering a way to revisit uh, the sort of encyclopedic structure of the system and somehow revisit uh, some basic forms of the psychology like Empfindung and Gefühl uh, that are actually expanded uh, through the works of the art in in the case that you're making uh, music. So uh, my question is really um, a relation or a sort of revisitation of subjective spirit in the light of uh, the work of the arts, which also means, I mean, underlying is a thought that something that Marx was thinking, our senses are not done and completed. Uh, Our senses have a history. And uh, um, according to what uh, we eat, uh, our, even our sense of taste changes. Uh, so, okay, so I'll stop here and uh, thank you again. Uh, well, thank you, Angelica. It's so nice to see you too. Um, I, I could not agree more. And I think um, work on the psychology and the anthropology and the earlier parts of of philosophy of spirit would benefit enormously from more attention to what Hegel says about the arts. Um, And and I love your bringing up Marx there too, because I I do think that Hegel is gesturing at something like that, that we, to think of the senses as static would be to think of them as given in a way that would be well, both problematic systematically for Hegel, but also not true to our understand our, our own experience of the way emotions, well, in the case of music, emotions change over time. And certainly Hegel, like in the case of painting, I think there's a lot that could be done on what he says about the senses and vision and thinking about the way he describes our interaction with painting bringing forward our own awareness of the way we see the world and our participation in what the world is like. So again, I think Hegel thinks we do that all day, every day, but we forget um, because we we have to just sort of go, (laughs) we have to get out of bed in the morning, we have to teach our classes. Um, But when we look at a painting and it brings our attention to our ability to see three dimensions where there are only two, or to see a a figure where there are only colors. So just juxtaposing colors can show us a shape. Um, We get a sense of ourselves as much more active in the world. And part of what's interesting about Hegel's lack of discussion of aesthetic experience is that if that's true, then much more like Kant's vision, we can have an aesthetic experience of almost anything, right? So if you, if you look at the world in a certain way and you don't just take it as given, but you, you know that you are bringing some sort of sense of, you know, everything, color and shape and depth to it, um, then there's also more opportunity for beauty in the world. So when Hegel says, you know, beauty of nature, not interested, I think he does himself a disservice. Um, so yes, absolutely. And I think there, there are several other things, like I mentioned, perception, or even just our understanding of what Hegel means by freedom, which you know, he talks about our working out of through the anthropology, through habit and all of that. There's much more to be said about the tactile um, aspects of that if we take part three of the aesthetics more seriously and as informing the earlier parts of the system. So. Absolutely. Thank you for putting it uh, so beautifully. That's exactly what I would say, too, if I could say that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I think, Varane, you're next. <clears throat> um, yeah, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. I, I really enjoyed it, and um, I've also been enjoying your book. Um, so um, my, my question um, comes is, is actually, I think, some, could, somewhat related to what um, Angelica uh, Nutso was, was talking about. Um, 
but I want to come back to the the problem of time because it seems like that was you you began with that, um, and the question was really about this this relationship between music time and subjectivity, um, and it seems like what music enables us to grasp is a kind of homological structure between time and, and, and subjectivity. Um, and I wanted to get it one way in which you express, well, actually it's a citation, I think from, from Hegel, and that's where you talk about this, the self, you say the self is in time and time is the being of the subject. Um, and, and I wanted to sort of ask you to sort of unpack this a little more because the self being in time and time being uh, time being the, in time being the being of, of the subject seems to be it, i'm not sure if those are the same thing i mean because if if that's the case then the self is in the being of the, of the subject but but it seems like maybe there are two different ways of thinking about time here or or or, or how do we think about that i mean that that was and, and this could be related to the whole problem of the content of music Right, because in, 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 a, in a section, what you mentioned like melody and harmony and so on, and that seems to be all about, there's, there's a kind of flow of time here, like a sequence of notes in, in proportion and so on, right? And, that, and, and I was wondering how, the, I was just wondering whether there are two different senses of time at play here, or is it all one, or is it, how do we think about this? Yeah, thanks um, for that. Um... Hegel's very syntax in these passages, I think, gets at how hard it is to say what he wants to say. And that's not to give, you know, excuses for bad writing, but um, there's some of that in Hegel too. But, but I do think that he's, he feels himself in these, like some of those passages that I read, including the one that you just cited, you can kind of feel things bottoming out, right? He, it's, it's almost sort of repetitive and it's saying the same thing over and over, first from direction A and then from direction B. And I think what Hegel would want to, us to conclude from that is that it isn't one or the other. It's not that time exists and then we discover ourselves in time or that we exist and then we find time to help ourselves understand. But, but that there's like, again, like with everything uh, Hegel thinks, there's a way in which we can only experience ourselves once we conceptualize ourselves through time, and once we conceptualize ourselves through time, time also exists for us anyway. Um, and back to Angelica's question, like what you could say about what Hegel says about time, given what he says mm -hmm. about music, is in, would be another great thing for someone to explore. And I am not, mm -hmm. that is above my pay grade for sure. Um, but, but I do think that, like, one of the things that he says about rhythm and melody in the, subject, mm. in the parts that I didn't read is that we only sense time if it's interrupted, right? Mm. So if, if the whole world were red, we wouldn't see red, right? If we have to interrupt red in order to see red. So we can't sense time until we interrupt it. And so that's part of what music does, both in allowing us to hear rhythm um so to hear like measures and beats and half notes as opposed to whole notes etc that we we start to conceptualize time through its interruption and in being interrupted ourselves think of ourselves <laughs> right so mm -hmm. so in both cases there has to be some sort of an interruption and that's true of harmony too right there has to be some sort of distortion in order to sense the Harmony. So I think this is why Hegel is much more interested in melody as mm -hmm. the most important part of mm -hmm. music than harmony, because he's so committed to it um, stretching out over time. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure that that gets to the bottom of your question, but I do think that Hegel wants it not to be an either or um, answer. And he wants us to think about all of the ways in which our own subjectivity only exists, exists both through being interrupted and also through beginning to realize that it's our memories that allow us to have a self. So just like a melody doesn't exist unless someone remembers the five notes that came before this one, the self mm -hmm. can't be aware of itself unless it has memories of the five minutes that came before this one. No, so anyway, that's... I think that's probably as, as deep as I can get, but I don't know. If no, that no, that's helpful. No, that's helpful. Um, yeah, I'll 
I'll, there, there are other questions, so I'll. <laughs> sure, thank you. And there might be time if you want to come back uh, later, Virain, so, you know, let me know. Uh, Christoph, I think you are next. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was incredibly interesting. And um, so much on the phenomenology of music. Um, so much of the detail was really interesting. And I, I'd like to think about that more. But I um, want to ask you something kind of relatively fundamental, really, about um, the relationship between music and poetry. Um, and I sort of can't resist going back to the Beethoven point, because it's such a sort of striking thing. And I thought about it a bit last year, because, because of the, two, <laughs> the shared 250th anniversaries. Um, and I looked into this, and from, from what I remember, and I don't know if this is me um, interpreting a, a comment that he makes, but from what I remember, he even says something like that um, it's, it's a really sort of unconscionable idea to try and set the ode to joy specifically to music, as if he's sort of, he's got some kind of reference to Beethoven going on um, obliquely, and I'm, I'm not I'm not sure if that's right. Um, but, but the thing I really wanted to ask about was whether, um, whether it isn't the case, and I'm sure that you'll say that it isn't, but whether it isn't the case that um, you know, if the task of art is to bring the idea to the senses, it looks like um, music does this to a certain degree, but then uh, poetry just does this more effectively. And so if you have poetry, you know, why, why bother with music? And you know, it's not just that we mustn't mix the two and you know, set music to poetry, but that um, if you can have poetry because it's conceptual and because of various other um, features about it, um, it sounds like you, know, you would just leave music behind. And I don't, I don't know if it's something in, in the specific way in which music um, allows us to constitute ourselves through feeling that, that would be different from poetry, but I just wondered if, if you could say something about um, how I should understand why it is that, um, you know, poetry doesn't just do better than music all round. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think my answer there is related to my answer to the question of whether Hegel thinks we'd be better off without art, right? If, if philosophy can do what art does, but better, then you know, would we have a better world if we just got rid of art? Um, and I think the answer is absolutely not. <laughs> so I really think that um, Hegel thought that art, you know, we are embodied beings. And so to have access to the truth that has to do with our embodiment is actually critical for us. We're not just minds. Um, and so I don't think that Hegel thinks that that's a tragic thing or a disappointing thing or says anything bad about us. It just, we're lucky that we have art and we should continue to do art because it is the thing that allows us to uh, conceptualize the idea through a very important part of us, which is our senses. And I would say the same thing about music and poetry. So poetry, poetry's material is not sound. Poetry's material is imagination and the imagined images. So Hegel thinks that poetry combines music and painting insofar as it, it requires a sequence of words, the way music requires a sequence of tones, but that sequence of words is supposed to come together into an image. So Hegel runs into trouble with with non image with non representational poetry, right? Surrealist poetry or whatever he'd really have nothing to say about. And so since poetry does something different, right? And another thing that poetry does it is it brings our attention to our language. So just as back to Angelica's question, we shouldn't think about many things in our world as just given that we discover, but that instead as things that we mutually create with each other. It's very important for us always to remember that our language is a mutual creation and that it's something that we share responsibility for and have to um, take ownership of. So music can't do that, but it can still talk about all of these, uh, or not talk about, but it allows us to feel subjectivity in ways that go beyond the conceptualization and the linguistic basis that poetry is based in. And I don't think Hegel thinks we can or should get past that. So in all of the ways that 
I mean, again, so we're embodied beings, we need something that gets us to think about the, or to experience um, the idea in embodied ways. We're also feeling beings. And so we will benefit from something that allows us to feel and allows us to educate our feelings in ways that poetry can't. So in one of the sections I didn't read, I talked some about Hegel's um, kind of underdeveloped and in some ways contradictory claim or unsubstantiated claim that music helps us evaluate and elevate our feelings. Now poetry can't really do that because poetry is going to be distracting us with images or, or our attention is just going to be brought somewhere else. If, poetry, if music is the thing that allows us really to feel feelings without their relation to content, then that's going to still be very important for us. Um, as far as I just wanted, I'm not sure about um, Schiller. I mean, he certainly talks about other Schiller poems that are not um, so great. Um, and, and part of what is always so <laughs> amusing to me is when Hegel says, in order for poetry to function well in music, it can't be very good. Like we can't have good poetry in music because then you'll get distracted by the images and not really feel the feeling. So I would also take that as evidence of what you were just, what I was just arguing, that we still need a space to feel our feelings. And of course, what's ironic about that is that Schiller himself didn't think Ode to Joy was such a great poem. And so I think Hegel would have been like, boom, you know, it's exactly what I'm talking about, right? Why does that work so well in Beethoven? It's because it's not very good poetry. So it doesn't really distract us from what we're primarily doing, which is feeling. And again, to sort of go uh, in the direction that Bowie was leading us, um, feel some emotions that we didn't even really know we, or weren't even really familiar with, weren't conceptualizing yet in the same way, again, back to Angelica's point that we need to be aware that our senses aren't just fully formed. Our emotional lives are also not fully formed. Great, thank you. Um, I guess the, the counter example, I, I think as you were saying um, to Hegel's claim about um, good poetry being set to music is things like El König, the, the, the great poem set by Schubert, which right. presumably he, he didn't, didn't know. Yeah, right. And that, that, that remains something of a puzzle that, that he, couldn't, but I guess I'd say that for systematic reasons, you can understand why he wouldn't even be looking for such great poetry in forming um, great music because he had kind of ruled it out conceptually. Thanks. Uh, okay, Lydia, I'm gonna step in with a question of my own if I might at this point. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you about um, a remark you make where you said Hegel's vision was especially limited as regards music. Um, now the context is the development of music after Hegel's lifetime, but I, I guess what I'd like you to say a bit more about is, is exactly what you mean by this. Um, and the context of this question is uh, the following. Um, my understanding is that for Hegel, there is a normative dimension to his aesthetics. Um, that he operates with the idea of what counts as true art. And you cited that uh, uh, passage where he talks about something becoming uh, untrue to, to art. Um, but it's kind of interesting to see <clears throat> what he thinks needs to be present in music for it to count as music. Um, and the passage I'm, I'm interested in, it's 939 in, in, the, in the Knox translation. Um, and he's talking about uh, Palestrina, Gluck, Haydn, Mozart. And he says there, grief is expressed, but it's assuaged at once. And then further down, and he's actually referring back to Italian painting here, but, but obviously got music in mind. He said that even in the deepest grief and the most extreme distraction of soul, that reconciliation with self, which even in tears and sorrows, preserves the trays of peace and happy assurance is not allowed to be missing. So from that point of view, if I take that idea, then I could say, okay, let's look at Beethoven. And one might say, <clears throat> Hegel's vision is limited here, as you put it, because he's not seeing that what he's just said applies to Beethoven. Um, Schubert too, although Schubert gets perhaps closer to moments of unassuaged uh, uh, grief, um, but nonetheless, nonetheless um, 
Um, this idea, I think there's another phrase he uses, of smiling through tears, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is a wonderful phrase. Um, so, so there's that way of being limited, which would allow him to preserve um, his normative conception of what art must do. But of course, there's another way of being limited. And that is, and I wasn't sure whether you were hinting at this, uh, when you say um, that uh, he, uh, Hegel's inability to predict precisely how Beethoven's music would become evidence of feelings power. Well, of course, music can express feelings power without having that moment of of, of reconciliation, of the smiling through tears. Mm -hmm. But I think there are people who want to criticize Hegel for that, mm -hmm. for precisely saying that the emphasis on reconciliation, uh, you know, if you think of someone like Adorno, I suppose, is just at odds with the way that, that late capitalism develops, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm wondering if you could say something about where you see the limitation. Do you think that, I mean, would you align yourself with normative aspect um, uh, to music that Hegel identifies that that yes it can express pain and grief pain and grief but that moment of resolution has to be there um, or would you want to say actually no um, you'd want to go beyond that and you'd want to take something out of theory, Hegel's theory of music its expressive power for example and uncouple it from those notions of resolution um, and I'm I guess I'm interested obviously in the sort of political connections here, because I suppose what one says about art, one might also relate to the political and social order that we, we live in. Anyway, that was what I would like to hear a little bit more about. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, that's very interesting. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, Hegel had to be committed to this idea of reconciliation in order to have the conception that he did of the true being the whole and the, you know, our unity of unity and division and all of that. And I do think that that sometimes gets in his way. So I think there are cases when he wants more reconciliation than is strictly good for us. And that's obviously part of Adorno's critique too, that anytime you have someone who insists on everything coming out in the wash, um, there's going to be a lot of things that don't get acknowledged. A lot of, uh, you know, th then there's a kind of hegemonic, no, you must resolve, it must all fit, it must all come out all right. Um, I don't really know that there's a way of rescuing Hegel from that because of his metaphysical um, commitments, although I do think that there's much more room for that kind of thing in Hegel than people often think there is because when he gets to the end of art, as in like post-romantic art, he is essentially just saying, okay, folks, all art from here on out is going to grapple with the question of what it means to live in late modernity. And that's not always pretty, but, and we don't know how it's going to look and we don't know how people are going to grapple with it. We just know that that's what's going to happen. So have at it. So I do think that he would be open to a lot more dissonance in art and ugliness in art and et cetera, than um, sometimes people think he would. But I do think he is uh, limited by his insistence on, on reconciliation. And I think what he says about comedy um, in that vein is really instructive. So <laughs> um, there's this absolutely infuriating passage on like page 1184 of the aesthetics, like you're almost to the end and you've, you've stuck with him through every single permutation of Persian art and Indian art and this poet and that kind of architecture and everything else. And then he says, um, as far as tragedy and comedy goes, I think I prefer comedy and why not? And you just think, wait a minute, why not? You know, you're not allowed to say that. Systematic people are not allowed <laughs> to say that. But I, I ended up writing a whole article <laughs> because it made me so mad. Um, and I think it is actually a kind of principled stance on Hegel's part, namely that at a certain point, art is just grappling in all these different ways. And if it grapples in a way that asserts our freedom, as opposed to our being trapped by tragic norms, then we should probably go with the comic vision. Like we should go with the vision that allows us to recognize our own foibles and not see everything as in a permanent stage of conflict, et cetera. Um, so that it, I guess this is a very long way of getting uh, to some kind of an answer, which is that I do think there's a kind of 
I don't know if I quite want to call it normative, but there is a reason to try to see the world in more comic terms, in more terms of resolution than in terms of tragedy. And of course, it's ironic that Hegel's much more famous for his theory of tragedy than he is of comedy, which is part of how I got uh, interested in doing what I've done on the philosophy of humor and ended up um, interviewing Michael Stern, William Jackson Harper. Um, so that, that would be one part of my answer. And then I think, Uh, video? For I think we've lost you there. Too new. I think a lot of. So I think okay. we lost you there for a moment. Where did I cut off? Um, okay, just, am I back? Yes, you're, yeah, you're back. I would say like about sort of, you know, 20 seconds, 25 seconds ago. Okay, um, let's see. You've just Where been talking about, about comedy. Yeah, okay, so I think, yeah, speaking of having a sense of yourself through time, where was I 20 seconds ago, right? Um, <laughs> I think what I, yeah, what I wanted to say was if, um, if we have a sense of Beethoven as too close for Hegel to see clearly, in a way, and I, I, there were certainly people who, who appreciated Beethoven very much in the moment, but given Hegel's preference for things that were, had a smaller emotional scale, didn't have quite the jarring dissonances, I think he didn't quite understand that Beethoven was in fact presenting a new set of emotions and a more comprehensive way of resolving them. And I think, so I think most people, and this is where it gets very ironic again, most people do experience Beethoven and especially the Ninth Symphony and Ode to Joy as a huge like reconciliative catharsis, right? I mean, I was just watching, there's a video, video of the Muppets doing Beethoven's, you know, the Ode to Joy part, right? Like everybody does it in part because it so now gives us the sense that Hegel thought art should have but didn't think Beethoven, but thought Beethoven himself was too extreme to generate. And I think he was, I just think he couldn't see that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, good, thank you. Just one follow up to that. And that's just to, 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 to emphasize, and, and I don't know if you've got any thoughts about this, um, this idea that, that Hegel was worried about music becoming um, inaccessible, you, you, you highlight that. And I wonder if that's partly got to do with the, the, the extent to which certain forms of music, Hegel thought at least anyway, were lacking this moment of, of reconciliation, of, of, of joy that obviously he finds in Rossini, and that he also finds in folk music. And I'm thinking, you know, the magic flute has moments of, of, of real pain and grief, but then also genuine joy as well. And that Hegel describes as a vaudeville. Mm -hmm. Now, we use the term vaudeville differently nowadays, but, but nonetheless. So I wonder if focusing on this question of resolution and reconciliation might also help us illuminate why, for example, in the 20th century, certain forms of so-called high music really became detached from the public that in other ways was embracing, you know, Fred Astaire or, yeah. or, or and later on, you know, various forms of folk music and rock music, which many, you know, however radical you might think rock music is, it isn't when it comes to basic, you know, structure of, of, of dissonance or resolution. I mean, you know, that's how enough, uh, often pop songs work. And, and I wonder if Hegel's got a little bit of, of insight into that. Um, if one focuses on and keeps in mind that need for some form of resolution, that, that, that spirit needs it. Um, mm -hmm. Now you might say, okay, he goes over the top and perhaps then at times downplays um, other, other forms of expression. But anyway, I just wanted to put in a sort of a word for that side of things. I don't know if you want to come back uh, on that. Yeah, well, I'll just say very quickly that um, insofar again as music's continued popularity in pop music, uh, no pun intended, it clearly, with feeling, especially in ages where things are, let's see, I feel like am I breaking up again? Um, no, you're okay. You're where okay. there's a lot of social, 
Okay, a lot of social unrest and um, longing for things to make sense again. And I think Hegel would recognize that that can also be dangerous, that if we allow ourselves too easy or too full of feeling a resolution, that we can also go in the wrong direction. But it would certainly explain why uh, music continues to be as powerful now as it ever has been. Good, thank you. Okay, I think we've got time. Vere, do you think you wanted to ask another question? Yeah, so no, I just, yeah, I just want to, to follow up. Thanks. Um, and I want to, I think because the, the sort of interaction between and you and Stephen has been very, very interesting. And, and it, this may look like a bit of a flashback to the other conference where I, I, I listened to you at the, the philosophy of right conference. But, but, but in any case, um, the the problem of resolution and and the, and the question of uh, when when you're talking about um, the the limitations of Hegel and, and and so on. After that, you also mentioned you you sort of bring him into the contemporary to some extent with John Cage and so on and and that kind of. And so I wanted to sort of see if we could try to think this question in relation to this problem of the end of art, right? Um, and the end and the various takes on the end of art thesis. Because if we think about it, we've got, you know, Arthur Danto has come up with, with his version of this, uh, of, of his reading. I think Pippin also has a version of this. And, and I think what, what they sort of wanted to say is, oh, what happens eventually is that art becomes conceptual. So art sort of transitions into philosophy. Uh, and what that means is then is that it's, it's, it's sort of grasp, it, it grasps the contradictions of a certain society, not sensually, but but almost as as philosophy and so then the the reconciliation is perhaps in the future or something like that and so i was wondering um what what your take on that was um that that how you would bring him into dialogue with contemporary kind of visions i was also thinking of tj clark for example right with is modernism the end of an idea right i mean there again modernism the, the whole point of it is that it sort of grasps certain contradictions, but then wants to point beyond it so that, that there is a kind of reconciliation, but the reconciliation is in the future, right? And then what he, then he laments, right? Because the end of an idea, well, what's happened today is that that's gone. Now, if we think about that in terms of music, well, then maybe John Cage is, 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 is expressing that. But then the problem with that is that, as you, as you suggest, there's a question of, is it music? still you know and so that does it does it is it still fulfilling the role that music is playing and and i think that i'm not sure if i would buy what what pippin says in the sense that it you know he's, he's talking more about visual arts but even if you if you apply it to music and you say well now music has become philosophy you know four minutes and 33 seconds that's music becoming philosophy i don't know if that's quite right um because it doesn't it's not it's not prosaic quite uh it's not you know but but, but nonetheless, there is something about the sensuous dimension that seems to have, have, have is, is not there anymore. I mean, so, so I was just wondering what, what, what your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think I, I mean, it's partly through those kinds of um, articulations, Danto and Pippin and Clark, that I, I just couldn't make sense of all of the other ways that Hegel talks about art ending under those descriptions. So, so what I would say about those is that they fall somewhere under my second category of conceptual endings. And so, yes, there are definitely moments in which music becomes more like philosophy or what it triggers in us is more like philosophizing. So it makes us think, right? It makes us play with the ideas of what is music and what isn't music or what is painting or what isn't painting. And again, to build on what I said earlier, I think Hegel would say, fine, like if that's part of what you need to do as a society to keep playing out this, these anxieties about what the foundations are and what our new emotions are, then that's okay. Um, however, there, and this goes back to my our earlier conversation too, there is still a need for something that is art and not philosophy. And there is still a way in which philosophy is not art. And there is still in that same sort of description, a need for music that doesn't just make us play with questions of harmony or silence or whatever, but that makes us feel. 
And there's certainly a lot of contemporary classical music, however you understand that, that also does that. Um, but it's, you know, it's not as much in the mainstream. Um, so I guess I would say where I ended up in all of this was that all of those people are articulating one part of an insight that Hegel has about the end of art. But it's just one part. And unless we look at some other parts, we're not going to understand all the different ways he uses the phrase. Thanks. Good. Well, thank you very much, Lydia. Thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, and um, I hope that in uh, future years, we can actually get you over here uh, to the conference in, in Oxford. Um, so please all uh, join together. I mean, stick up your yellow hands or put your um, uh, uh, microphones on that you can clap. But please uh, uh, join me in thanking Lydia for a very, very interesting and stimulating talk. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your, your time and attention. And yes, may we all see each other in person someday from your mouth to God's ears. Good. And just before you all go, can I announce that the next talk in our series uh, will be on November the 22nd, um, uh, delivered by Christoph Schuringer, um, who is uh, attending today on Marx's critique of um, Hegel's uh, philosophy of right, I think, is that right? Or theory of the state. Um, so we'll hope very much that you can join us uh, then. Meanwhile, um, please check out um, um, uh, Lydia's book and also get yourself the DVDs of The Good Place and start watching. You'll, you'll love it. <laughs> anyway, thanks ever so much, Lydia. And uh, we'll hope to see yeah, you again sometime. Again, see you. Okay, yes. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye-bye, so everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And thank you, Philip.